Thank you, thank you. I'm not quite sure how to start this because um, I feel I should say something about our Queen, something about the new King, something about Jesus, the King of Kings, something about the options that the Israelites had. Um, I, I just will say, I, in Chronicles, the, the death of a monarch was recorded with the line, it was normally he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, or he did good in the eyes of the Lord. And I'm just grateful that I've lived all of my life under a monarch who I believe did good in the eyes of the Lord. And that's given our nation a certain sense of security and peace and blessing and for which I'm incredibly grateful. And I think Margaret's absolutely right in that because of the change in the air, because of the opportunity that not only a new prime minister but a new king brings. There'll never be another week like this, will there? There'll never be another week certainly in my lifetime and probably not in my grandchildren's lifetime, where at the beginning of the week you have one prime minister and one sovereign, and at the end of the week you have a different prime minister and a different sovereign. This is a strategic time, so Lord, we pray for this nation. As we've done already this morning, we ask, Lord God, that you, by your spirit, would move amongst our people that you would move in this nation to reveal Jesus, that you would reveal Jesus as the King of Kings, that you would reveal Jesus as King of Kings in his splendor and majesty, might and authority. We pray too that you would reveal Jesus as a suffering servant, as the one who came to give his life as a ransom for many, that you would reveal Jesus as he takes his throne in nakedness at a cross, that you'd reveal Jesus as the one who comes alongside to bless, to bring freedom and forgiveness and life. We pray that you would reveal Jesus, the empty tomb and the victory and the hope, and the expectation. We pray that you would reveal Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask. Amen. Amen. We've been. I want to talk about when God speaks. And uh, last week we looked at creation and and the way that God spoke uh, creation into being. One of the surprising things about Genesis and Exodus is the number of times that God speaks to different individuals. But there's a key time. A key time at the beginning of Exodus, uh, sorry, in the middle of Exodus, where it says God spoke all these words. This is Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1. And, uh, and this is the archetypal, I think, Old Testament uh, situation where God speaks, where God gives us the Ten Commandments. And I want to put it to you that the, the Ten Commandments are really an invitation an opportunity to decide what sovereign you're going to live under. You see, the, the people of, of Israel, the, well, they weren't really the people of Israel by that time. The Hebrews had been released from slavery by Moses, the most unlikely candidate to lead the people out of Egypt, but probably the best person to do it. Despite the objections he offers to God and the difficulties he has with Pharaoh, he, he leads the people through the Red Sea. Unfortunately, they can't go straight into the uh, land of milk and honey, the promised land of Canaan. And so they spend a, a generation walking around the desert, wandering. The joke is that it took them 40 years to find the only bit in the Middle East that doesn't have oil. Uh, I, <laughs> it's unfortunate. In milk and honey, yep, oil. No, well, what would you choose? Anyway, they, uh, and in the, towards the beginning of this wilderness wandering, God speaks to them, and God spoke all these words. 
And these words that he speaks, I suggest, are perhaps the most important that have been spoken into any society, that have become foundational for our society, that they've become fa foundational for many societies around the world, as their legal system, as a hierarchy, as a, 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 the structure of society is built around these ten commands. And, and the Queen, as the head of the Church of England and as the head of the state, it was commissioned to uphold these. Every Church of England, of which the Queen and now the King is the head, of course, uh, have the Ten Commandments in the, uh, the front of the church. It's the basis of our legal system. It's the basis of many legal systems around the world, probably one could say, although if you come next week, you'll hear different because I'm going to say something different. But to this point anyway, and up to the, throughout the Old Testament, the most important thing that God has ever said. And God spoke all these words. But just as last week we saw that the story of creation doesn't begin with day one, the, this thing that God says doesn't begin with commandment one. It begins with, I am the Lord your God. You see, when God speaks to us, it's to reveal himself. That's why prayers like Margaret's and mine this morning are so appropriate, because God loves to reveal himself. And when we say, Lord, won't you show yourself as, as Lord? Won't you show yourself as king? Won't you show yourself as servant? Won't you show yourself as the one who brings life? Then, then God does that sort of thing, because God loves to reveal himself. And he reveals himself through these words, I am the Lord your God. And often God is revealed by his actions that are explained. So I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt uh, is simply an explanation. I'm the one who's done that. Uh, often in scripture there's a, uh, an action and then an explanation. The classic time is at Pentecost when the, the fire falls from heaven three thousand. Uh, 120 people are filled with the Holy Spirit. They speak in different languages. They find themselves outside. A crowd gathers. And Peter gets up and explains this odd thing that's happened that looks like people are drunk. And Peter says, no, it's not that. It's the Holy Spirit being poured out. And as a result of his explanation, 3,000 people become followers of Jesus. And very often the miracles are followed by an explanation because they reveal who God is. Jesus heals a, a blind man and then talks about, I'm the light of the world. It's the miracle followed by the explanation. That's what's happening here. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. God wants to speak to you to help you understand who he is. I am the Lord your God. God wants to speak to you to help you understand what he has done. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Let's skip that one. God wants to give us. No, let's say that again. God wants to give the Hebrews the opportunity of becoming his people. This is almost a manifesto. If you want me as your king, if you want me as your Lord, this is how it's going to be. In the New Testament, we might say, if you want relationship with me, and actually that's an Old Testament phrase as well. If you want relationship with me, this is how it's going to be. And it's almost as if God is at the top of the mountain with Moses. He's giving the, Moses these Ten Commandments. And he's offering an invitation to the people to say, which God do you want? Do you want me or not? Will you serve me or not? I'm the God... I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. If you're going to live in relationship with me, this is what it's going to look like. This is how it's going to be. Do you want to be my people? And of course, it was then up to the people of Israel, the people, sorry, the Hebrews, to decide whether or not they were going to accept that opportunity, that offer if you like. Because God speaks, not only to show us who he is, not only to explain what he's done, but God also speaks to invite us into relationship with him. 
And so the Ten Commandments offer these alternatives. It's not so much a system of rules to obey, but conditions on a covenant, an agreement. Effectively, God is offering these redeemed slaves the opportunity to be his people. So what does that relationship look like? Well, firstly, it's an exclusive relationship. The scripture says, doesn't it? God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You will have no other gods before me. This is an exclusive relationship. Primarily, you are to have no other gods before me. Of course not. Because as Belinda spoke last Sunday night... There was a, a, a spiritual battle in Egypt that's, that's recorded for us in the plagues, where, where you have Yahweh against the frog gods, Yahweh against the Nile gods, Yahweh against the, the, the gods that were meant to protect their crops. You had Yahweh winning. Yahweh beat Israel, uh, sorry, well, Yahweh beat Egypt's gods. So why would you have any other god before him? The fertility gods, the, the gods that were meant to, to help the people of Egypt. Yahweh won. Why would you have any other gods? And I would suggest to you this morning that the evidence of the last few years, the prospects of our short-term future, and even the events of this last week have shown us the wisdom of obeying this commandment, accepting this invitation. Because there's several... Gods, aren't there, evident in our society? The, the shopping temples that were left unused for months. The uh, high streets empty. The sporting temples that have closed. Mammon is worth 10% less than it was a year ago. Even great queens die. Prime ministers come and go. And the question is, where are we putting our trust? Society's so unsure, isn't it? And this nation at the moment with the uncertainty of a new prime minister and a new king, how can we live in a way where we have no other gods before him? Moses is quite happy to acknowledge the existence of other gods. But he says, we don't worship them. We're not looking to them. We're not trusting in them. We're not putting our hope in them. You shall have no other gods before me, Yahweh says. So can I ask you this week, each day, to simply ask, what does it mean for me to put you first, Lord? What does it mean, Jesus, for me to put you first? And don't make an image of God. So it seems that the golden calf they made while Moses was up the mountain wasn't a, a, another god. It was an image of Yahweh. It was, a, a, your God is strong, your God is mighty, your God is beautiful. And so we'll make an image of him that, that looks like a cow. And uh, it's what a ridiculous thing to try and attempt to picture Yahweh like that. God isn't imaged by any animal. Our image of God, the image of God that we do have, and we've already heard from Genesis chapter 1, the image of God that we do have is mankind, men and women. So, so we don't worship idols, we love people. Because they're the image of God. And of course the best image of God we have is our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the image of God walked amongst us, moved amongst us, died for us, was raised again for us. He is the image of the invisible God. And so we don't worship idols, we worship Jesus. That's the invitation to live for him, not to worship uh, anything that, uh, the, the, not, not to worship our own images of God, but to love one another and to worship Jesus. To create another image is pointless, isn't it? To picture God as a stubborn cow detracts from who he really is. Number four, that's amazing. Number four, that's incredible. Because in the gods of their recent history, the Egyptians had demanded seven days a week labor. They demanded over time more and more for less and less until eventually they were making bricks without straw. 
But now these slaves were changing allegiance. Now these slaves were going to live under a new king. Now these slaves were going to have the opportunity of saying, we will serve the Lord. And if they were going to do that, they needed to have a Sabbath. They needed to take a day off. Can you imagine? I, in my household, I don't know about yours, but in my household, there was a lot of, a lot of interest into whether we would get a bank holiday. Uh, I don't know, maybe you were all much more mournful and concerned about everything. Uh, but, and, uh, but for my family, it just seemed to be, are we going to get a day off? Uh, that was the... And, uh, and then hopefully there'll be another one for the coronation. And uh, we'll... we'll and uh, <laughs> it's one or two amens in the house. <laughs> but I'm sorry, that, that was where they were at. Uh, to be honest, where I was at. No, let's move on. 400 years they'd suffered slavery. Never a day off. Not even for Christmas. That was a joke, by the way. You were allowed to laugh at that point. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it was a good joke, really, wasn't it? <laughs> Never a day off. And then God says, one in seven. One in seven. I want you to stop, because Sabbath means stop. I want you to stop. For, for me, I do this Wednesdays, and the most helpful teaching I've had around it is, is take 24 hours where you stop. Where you do something that pulls you closer to God. Maybe this. Great. Good choice. Where you do something you enjoy, preferably outside. So I tried to do that on Wednesdays, and it has been such a help to me when I realized that I shouldn't be breaking commandment number four. One in seven. Stop. Do something that connects you with heaven. Something you enjoy. Something that is preferably outside. Because for these slaves, God was saying, I want you to build in time to remember me. To eat together. To be together. To worship together. Set apart a day for me. If you're going to be my people, I'm insisting on that. That you stop. That you will, if you're going to be my people, you will take a day to recognize that you are not indispensable. That you can't work your fingers to the bone. You're going to take a day when you cannot pretend that I, your Lord, am a slave driver. You're going to take a day so that the perfectionists among you are going to have to stop to build in time to remember me. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, he says. And of course, in the New Testament, this is the only, of, only one of the Ten Commandments that isn't reiterated. Nowhere does it tell us in the New Testament to do this because the whole of our life, according to the book of Hebrews, is meant to be lived out of that rhythm of Sabbath rest, of, of coming out of a place of uh, the whole of our life, coming out of that place of connection with heaven, of worship, of prayer, of remembrance, and a rhythm that includes stopping. God wants his people to keep Sabbath. Why else would it be emphasized so strongly in Genesis chapter 1? A, a huge argument about the reason that there's the seven-day uh, thing in, in Genesis is nothing to do with, with um, epochs and millennia or, or days or 24 hours or how the whole thing was created. It's simply a justification for Sabbath right at the beginning of our origin story. I, Take that as you wish. Anyway, moving on. Uh, God speaks from and to and for community. If, if you're going to be part of my gang, God says, if you're going to be one of my people, if you're going to be in relationship with me, then that looks like community because 
we know God is in community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, loving and serving, giving way to one another, consulting one another, blessing one another, honoring one another, pointing to one another. That's what God does. And within that God community that spilled out to us, there's a, there's a primacy on community. Because it reflects the nature of God. So a priority is family. Honouring parents. The older I get, the more important I think this commandment becomes. I, <laughs> I, I like this idea much more than I ever used to. Um, I'm sure it means financing parents in old age. I'm, I'm sure it means keeping them in a good state of health as much as possible and to look after them as tenderly as you can until if there, is, if there has to be a nursing home, of course it has to be the best possible <laughs> nursing home. It involves having absolutely the correct access to grandchildren, not too much, not too little, not taking <laughs> all of that. I just think this is such a vital uh, commandment. I could preach on it for the rest of the day. Um, but of course, unfortunately, the Hebrews didn't live in uh, nuclear families, did they? Their families included, uh, you know, the, the, the kid who hadn't got any other parents. It included the, the person who looked after the cows. It included the lowest slave who'd, who'd just come and said, please, I want to belong to you. Won't you mark my uh, ear? And, uh, and I, I want to be part of your family. It included the hangers-on, the others. It was a huge community. And it's like this, this commandment is, uh, what do you do with aged parents if you're slaves? What do you do with aged parents if they can't make the bricks? Well, God says, you're not slaves anymore. You're not defined by your economic productivity anymore. So you can look after the ones who aren't pulling their weight you can look after the ones who are not being productive. You can look after the ones who are vulnerable. They're to be respected. And you will receive a reward for living like this. God says, you will live long in the land that I am giving you. Which king will you serve? Which king do you want to be under? Will you be mine, says the Lord. There's some wise community commands, aren't there, around killing. Must have been awkward for Moses, as he saw that one. Does that include Egyptians? <laughs> some good, uh, you know, our God is a God of peace. It reflects his heart, his desire for community, that we don't kill each other. Then there's a command about adultery, because our God is a faithful God. There's a command about not stealing, because that's not an appropriate a way to possess anything. Number nine is about truth-telling, being honorable in what we say, because our God can be trusted. His word is trustworthy, and living in relationship with him looks like him. Peaceful, faithful, honest, trustworthy. If you're going to be my people, that's how you live. Peaceably, faithfully, honestly, trustworthily. I wrote that earlier in the week and I read it later in the week and thought actually our queen embodied so much of that, didn't she? In terms of peace, faithful, honest, trustworthy. Because she had chosen to live under the authority of of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that's what relationship with God looks like. And then there's one at the end, number 10, which is really strange. Because it's thou shalt not covet. Don't be envious. Don't be jealous. And I say it's really strange because, of course, you can't make a law of that, can you? 
You, you can prosecute people for killing if you can weigh up the evidence and have, the, uh, ha have a uh, decision that, yes, that person did it. But you can't ever decide if someone's been jealous. You can't ever decide if someone's been envious, apart from the green tinge on their face. <laughs> or is that just in comics? I don't know. You can't decide if someone's been coveting something else from someone else. You don't know whether they're admiring it or if they just desperately want it. You can't tell that stuff. Uh, it, you can't make a law of it. And this, this is the key to the Ten Commandments. This is the key to the whole thing. This, this is the key that looks forward to Jesus and a new covenant. A covenant that will be written on our hearts. Because number 10 is a heart thing. It's a what do you experience in your mind and your heart when you see someone who's got something that is really nice. Really good. Really lovely. Are you able to say that and not want it? Or is there something in your heart that reaches out for it? And this commandment is a key to the rest of them because it tells us relationship with God is a heart thing. And that's why Jesus could say anger equals murder. Or he could say that lust equals adultery because it's a heart thing. And if you're going to live in relationship with me, then, then you need a new heart. And Jeremiah promised that later on, doesn't he? I'm going to take away a heart of stone because it would become that. And I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. Jesus says, I give you a new commandment. And you receive it by taking the bread into yourself and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in you, to nourish you, to change you, to soften you. To have a heart change heart transplant when God speaks he reveals himself he explains his actions he reveals his heart he invites us into covenant commitment Jesus says come and follow me I've shown you what God is like I've shown you my heart I've revealed God to you you get to reflect that Come and follow me. I think we stand at a remarkable, I think Margaret was absolutely right, we have a remarkable point in our nation's history where, please God, we have the opportunity to choose to follow the king that Queen Elizabeth served. Well, please, God, we have the opportunity to decide, yes, we will follow him. We will seek after the one who doesn't hide himself. And these are the characteristics of that God. Let's stand together. Let's pray. We had communion in the first service, and that somehow seemed appropriate, but we, we're not doing that this morning. We'll do that in a couple of weeks' time. But let's pray. Firstly, I want to pray for those of you this morning who heard this, and, and you just feel, I need to be following harder after this God. I need to be following this God much more closely. Maybe some other gods have got in the way. I need to be reflecting his characteristics much more. And so we simply want to say sorry, Father. And this morning we choose you. We don't want any slave driver overlords. We want to follow the God who brings freedom from slavery. We want to follow the God who brings us out of our Egypt. We want to follow the one, own the one who demonstrated what love is like by sending his son. We want to live with this sort of community. We want to live with this sort of heart. So we pray, Lord God, that you would soften our heart, that you would change our heart, that you would ignite our heart to love and follow and serve you.
If that was a significant prayer or thought for you this morning, then I'd really encourage you to come forward at the end of the service. And just around the cross here, Ian and some of the pastoral team will pray for you. But can we pray again for our nation, asking Lord God that people would choose you, that people would search for you, that you wouldn't be hidden. We thank you, Lord God, for those voices in the media who've testified to Queen Elizabeth's faith as well as her faithfulness. That those who've spoken about Jesus as well as spoken about her acts of service. We, we thank you for those voices and we pray, Lord God, that that would set people on a path to seek you while you may be found. That it will set them on a path to look for the King of Kings. And we pray, Lord God, as we prayed earlier in this service, that there'll be a harvest because of that seed that has fallen into the ground and died. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Eli, as you lead us in a last song. Bless you.